uh, origins, right? I showed a couple of videos and went through it, and there's still questions. I mean, people, maybe it's the concept, just thinking about the concept of knowing that the universe comes from nothing, right? Do you realize one of the biggest debates going on right now, as silly as this is about to sound, is what is nothing? <laughs> right, just, just, just think of that. You know, they define nothing differently. Now, how, how is it possible to have different definitions for nothing? Why do you think that would be? Somebody's in a corner, right? Somebody's in a corner. It's been a long time since we as Christians have gotten to the point where we actually now can see God's handiwork and see him operating in the world. So it's not being taught. Most, most people don't know it. And the people who spend their time kind of attacking us or making fun of our faith know it. So what they have to do is squirm around it. If you have to ask a child what nothing is, they'll probably have a pretty good idea. They'll probably be able to say, well, that means there's nothing, no thing, right? But it's funny how adults now will come in with different definitions, right? So the, one of the leading things going on right now is this idea of a vacuum, which is something. But they have to come up with, with some idea instead of just no thing. So if you just think about it, we can't actually, a, a, good, a good thing to realize, it's hard to get our heads around nothing. Since we're finite and since we're made of matter and we see things one dimensionally, start, you know, I woke up this morning, the day goes in one direction and then it ends. You know, my whole life kind of moves and start to finish. And so it's hard for me to visualize things as having absolutely no context whatsoever. But is that exactly what the Bible teaches? And that's what we're talking about, okay? So keep that in mind. This is a radical, radical discovery that we're talking about. We started yesterday. Now we're going to get into some of the math, some of the science about the fact that we're in a universe that popped into being from nothing. All right, so last week what we talked about was we said we're going to get into the, uh, the, the kind of the facts that every scientist knows. These things you're taught actually, if you go to Pleasant Lee over here, in middle school you can even be introduced to some of them, but by the time you're in freshman to sophomore level physics or any kind of even math, you begin to get these concepts. They, they start teaching them. So the reality is, some of the basic facts behind the universe beginning are being taught in school all the time, but nobody frames them around the fact that they point to a transcendent God. Okay? These all do. You put them all together, and they give you a really, really solid foundation for why nothing is possible in terms of something outside of nothing, up in terms of beginning. So in just the last hundred years, like I said last time, scientists are finding all these things. And as they're discovering them, they're getting really uncomfortable. This is not comfortable for people that spent their lives working on naturalistic explanations for, for the beginning of the world, the beginning of life, consciousness, and people. This is, this is really hard for scientists to get their heads around. So what I always do in here, you're kind of getting used to my pattern, right? Um, I have these interesting debates a lot of times with Christians. You know, they talk about, well, it's better to be a, what they call a presuppositionalist. What that means is you don't use evidence. You, everybody knows God exists, so you just use that uh, to frame up God exists. It's what we call inductive. You, well, we know it's true. Everybody knows it, so you're going to defend that position with people. I think some of that's really good, but I'm more of what we call an evidentialist. I mean, God, I think, reveals himself. You see him everywhere. So I love the revelation of God. So I tend to want to bring the Bible in. Bring the Bible into his revelation so you can see it. 
which is a little unique. Most apologists, because they're usually on the same terms as non-believers, they, they argue on their level, right? And that might be okay, but I think for us, our objective is not to come up with some good, sound arguments for why we're Christian. It's to grow in our faith in Jesus Christ. What we want to do is, as we're looking at these things, tie it back to what he's always been saying, what the Bible says. Because in the end, when the debates are over, all that's said and done, the only thing that's going to matter is how well you know him and your relationship to him. So when I always do this, what wisdom literature credits the universe as God's work, right? So I'm always pointing you guys back to what the Bible says. If we find something in the Bible that contradicts what we're seeing in science, in nature, anywhere, number one, it doesn't mean the Bible's wrong. It means we should try to understand why. Why am I seeing that? I haven't found anything yet that's a contradiction that has caused me any problems. Even something from nothing, right? It's a matter of just studying. So I like, I do this a lot, I, I go after atheists, because you know what the common thing I hear from non-believers? Well, I grew up a Christian and I know the Bible really well, and this is, this is why it's wrong. I'm like, really, you know the Bible really well? Okay, so, and then as I start talking to them, I, I say, well, you really don't know the Bible very well. You know the little snippets from atheist websites and conversations, but you don't know the Bible. So I think the best thing we can do is be grounded in the Bible and then see how the culture, the universe, the world re reflects, shows biblical truth. Does that make sense? Okay. So here's a little video for you guys from Gerald Schroeder. Now, Gerald Schroeder is an um, MIT physicist, and he teaches Torah in Israel. He's a Jew. And he's the one who really started leading this guy called Anthony Flew. Now, Anthony Flew was the <coughs> prominent analytical atheist, um, brilliant guy, back in the 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Some of his writings are what turned the world much more secular in universities. You can see him debating, uh, he, he was in the original Socratic club with C.S. Lewis. So he just passed away two or three years ago. He wrote a very famous book before he died. It's called, Why There Is a God. <laughs> because what happened to him, as a matter of fact, just to, uh, how many people have heard of Ravi Zacharias? So Ravi Zacharias kind of spent about 70 years just studying the Anthony Flu, just so he could get a good ground, good foundation for what's going on in our universities back then. So Flew just became a theist. He struggled with the resurrection, but he came out and admitted the fact there has to be a God with this evidence we're seeing. It's not possible. And he said the reason he did that is because he followed what was called the Socratic method, which means that you follow the evidence wherever it leads. And he said, if I'm going to be honest, I have to believe there's a God. So... What's the theme verse behind FSE University, behind Faith Substance and Evidence? What's our theme verse? Hebrews 1, or 11, 1. Anybody know it? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Right? See, that's exactly right. See what happened is happening? God says it. Hey, you know what faith really is? The substance of the things you hope for in the future and the evidence of an unseen God. So we follow the Socratic method. <laughs> Christianity is intellectual, rational, right? When I talk that way, though, a lot of churches, when they hear that, that's why they don't like it. Because most churches struggle with being intellectual. Because what does it sound like when you say intellectual? What does it sound like? <coughs> uh, yeah, yeah. And it's not at all what we mean. Uh, in modern day churches in many parts of our, our in America especially they're much more emotional they, they come they pull much more on feeling when there's nothing wrong with that but it's kind of zeal without knowledge is a problem isn't it to be all excited about something that's false so you've got to understand whether it's true or not it's not worth following so let's watch Schroeder talk here about he calls it believing in God in five minutes 
My name is Gerald Schroeder. I have, I have a, I got a strong science background from MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Bachelor's Master's PhD, Soviet Physics staff, seen a whole range of atomic bombs detonated, moved to Israel, met my wife, Barbara Sofer, a great writer, and uh, then uh, <coughs> teach Torah and science. So luckily, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky that I have the two that come together. And one of the questions is a, that I'm asked as a scientist is how can a scientist really believe that there's something that we refer to usually as God? You know, it's this metaphysical whatever acting in the world or producing the world. The irony is the question's really a non-starter. Science has in fact discovered God. And you can talk to the hardline atheists and they will say, it looks like science has indeed discovered God. And how would that be? Well, if you take the trouble of going to the web and, and they're typing WMAP, the initials for, for a satellite, it's a diagram that shows the development of the universe from the creation over time. It's a timeline. Every word on that diagram comes from the NASA site. It is the condensed knowledge of the scientific community of how the universe created and how it got to where we are today. Each of the lines, the vertical lines, is another billion years. Okay, you start from a burst of energy, the extreme left side of the diagram, and you end up at the far end with the oval. The oval is to indicate expansion in all directions. Of course, because the timeline, you can't show that on, on a single piece of paper. We see here, most amazingly, that on the extreme left edge, it shows a beginning to the universe. Now go back less than 50 years. If I were teaching that in tech, I might have been the person would use tenure say that there's creation of the universe. It sounds like it's Bible. Because as to 50 years ago, the overwhelming scientific opinion was the universe is eternal. There was never a beginning. The Bible is wrong from the very first sentence. And then we discovered, suddenly, Arno Penzies and Robert Wilson, the Bell Labs in New Jersey, the Northeastern US, discovered the echo of the Big Bang, the energy left over, which George Gamow, 60 years ago, predicted that if there had been a universe, created hot and small, it would have exploded, and the energy would get more and more dilute, and the, and Penzias and Wilson, these part of Penzias and Robert Wilson, discovered this energy that had been predicted overnight. The Bible got it right. There was a beginning to the universe. Now the black in the diagram is nothing. It's not a vacuum. Vacuums are within that diagram, within that cone of expansion. Back vacuums are empty space, and space is something. The black of the paper around the diagram is nothing. It doesn't fit in our human brain, because humans think in a box, a box made of time, space, and matter slash energy. No human, as clever as they might be, as expansive as they might be, thinks out of that box. So when we say outside that diagram is nothing, we can use the words, but we can't conceive of nothing. It doesn't fit in the human brain. How are we going to have this idea of is there God or not? Notice that the creation force isn't the three-letter word G-O-D. If you look at the words carefully, it's a quantum fluctuations. That understanding was first brought down by Ed Tryon, brilliant human being in the journal Nature, almost 40, 50 years, 40 years ago. The universe allows creation of something from nothing, provided you have the laws of nature, you know, quantum fluctuations. Tryon realized, and he published in the journal Nature, one of the two leading peer-reviewed journals in the world, that you can create something from absolute nothing, provided you've got the laws of nature, quantum physics and the laws of relativity. In other words, the laws of nature. So look what science has discovered. We can create the universe from absolute nothing, provided we have the, the, the forces of nature. Now the laws of nature, the forces of nature aren't physical, they act on the physical. So if they create the universe, that means they predate the universe. So now we have a set of forces, we call them the laws of nature, that are not physical, that are able to act on the physical, they create the physical from absolute nothing. And they predate the universe, which means they predate our understanding of time. Put that together, it sounds very familiar. If you haven't noticed it, that's the biblical definition of God. There's only one nuance that's less, less that's hanging, we can talk about it another time perhaps, is that which created the universe, those forces active in the universe. But up to that point, science says, we, you are correct, the, the definition of the biblical God is predates time, outside of time, God is not a physical being, is, is a force, and it creates the universe. 
You'll notice that the opening chapter of Genesis, the only name for God is Elohim, God as manifest in the universe. Science has indeed discovered the biblical God. Well, we just need one part left, crucial. That which created the universe is also active in the universe itself. The very fact that you're watching this now pretty much establishes that point. <coughs> Pretty cool, huh? So you'll be hoodwinked over and over again by people who aren't going to get down to the basics of what uh, we know. And we know this stuff, so don't allow that to happen. We're being taught this in schools, and these things tie back to a predated agent. So far, so good? All right, so here we go. We talked about this last week. We're going to be looking at these nine things. You have Newtonian physics. We know how things operate, right? You learn this in basic, basic math even, and basic uh, physics class in labs that you work in that anything that's not moving won't move. Something has to make it move, right? And anything that's moving will eventually slow down because it's being acted upon. Nothing moves forever. We know that anything that's accelerating or decelerating has to have been acted on, because nothing's constant. And we know that any time something's acted on, there's an equal and opposite reaction to it. Then we know the first law, that we have energy sources, but we're never creating new energy and never creating new matter. We're just using it up and converting it to another form. Then we know that as we work, as systems operate, they go to a state of decay or they run down, right? This is why you have drinks in front of you and why we eat breakfast, right? Because if we were a self-contained system that could operate independently forever, we wouldn't need anything. This is why we have to make sure we're buying batteries for our toys for our kids for Christmas, right? We have a world that, uh, that runs down that requires recharging all the time. We have a weird thing going on in the universe. We have red light that we see for everything moving apart. We have linear relationship we're gonna talk about today between the movements of things. This is really, really, really important, and I'll get into that in a minute. Um, we have instability. Einstein proved it. The universe does not behave constant with stability it's all relative depending on where you're looking. And then finally, just like you talked about a minute ago, we got all this remnant heat out there that's precise within about 10 standard deviations they're called in statistics. Almost the same number everywhere, precise spread out all through the universe. Okay? So here we go. We're in General theory of relativity, if you're in your book, we're, in, uh, we're starting out, we're still in right, the origins part, and here we're talking about, if you've got the small book here, if you've got this book two, we're on page 23, but we're looking at Einstein's theory of relativity, okay? I'm going to just kick us off here, just pray before we get started. Lord, thank you, Father, for another day of life. Thank you, Lord, for getting us going and warming us up here for... Uh, really facts of the universe that require us to think. I ask Lord you help us to understand you and to dig deeper into the things you show us. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so general theory of relativity. By itself, what it says is if you're in a vacuum, there's no gravity, in that vacuum, space and time won't be constant. They're going to change based on the velocity of the object relative to where you're looking. So what it's basically saying is Whenever you're looking at something, it's moving different than you. <laughs> They're not relatively the same. In an eternal universe, they would be. Everything would be relative to one another. I gave you the example last week. If you're in a car, and a, guy, a guy's coming up, you're passing someone, and then you slow down, and you guys are going exactly the same speed, you're going to look like you're, going, you're not moving. You're going to look the same. Right? You follow me? OK. That's what they thought before they discovered the general theory of relativity. Everything moved exactly the same, and the word moved wasn't even used. Everything was in sync and stable. 
When he discovered this, that that's not true, he knew right away there had to be a beginning. Because any time things are not the same, then one of those two points is sooner than the other. It just has to be. So you can always keep going backwards to try to discover that point of start. But that was all they had, because this is 1907 to 1915, roughly. Okay? So <clears throat> his equation isn't really used to calculate things. It's a general description of behavior, right? So it's not like gravity where you have a specific equation describing motion. This is more like a descriptive method to see how things interact. So he, here's how he got it. In uh, 1570s, matter of fact, if, you, if you're in your book, there's a page in there. It's this one in your books, right, where I go through and I show you all the different scientists, all right? Kepler, I start with him, and that's around the 1600s, 1570 time frame. He's the one who used the Bible to discover planetary motion. He's a Christian, he's a German guy, and he's working uh, to understand, try to figure out how planets move, and he's using shadows, and they've got a very archaic type telescope, and what he does, and you can, I, I'm pretty sure I found it on YouTube, and I found it on Google once. You can find all, find all the different calculations he did in a, they have it like in a, um, in manuscripts, in a, in a notebook, where he tried all these different shapes, geometric shapes, to try to figure out how the solar system and planets move. And he came up with ellipses, almost perfect circles. And he wrote then a lockdown equation. So the planetary laws of motion are based on that equation right there, a constant k, the area or surface that it moves in, and now he's got a fixed definition. Along comes Newton, and Newton discovers, so, well, besides movement, they actually attract one another. So the reason they stay in orbits is because there's some kind of forces interacting between them. Einstein goes off of this, and he discovers that the reality is light bends around objects. So gravity isn't necessarily a force. It's kind of a weird concept. When, when you're looking at this gravitational pull, it actually kind of bends around objects and moves, and he comes up with it's actually relative to one another. Okay. You'll see that sometimes when you, when you study gravity, they'll talk about it. Yeah, you can't really call it a force. It's more like, uh, it's more like an interactive effect between objects. We always call it a force because we understand it easier that way. That's how it works. So what happened to Einstein is uh, he had a problem, a major, major problem for him. In the, in, the, in the book, you can read about it, where the mathematicians of the day approached him because he put in a uh, cosmological constant into his equation for general theory of relativity that would zero out the denominator. And any time you in an equation, you have a denominator that's zero, it's infinite. So well, he did that intentionally, because he didn't want to deal with a beginning of a universe. So they came to him and said, dude, you can't do that. You can't use that factor in the denominator. Just plug it in there because it just negated your data. And he said, well, I have to, because if I don't, then the universe has a starting point. So he fought it. He didn't like it. So the whole point is he knew it, and he struggled with that. What happened was, what we're gonna get into here in a minute then on Hubble Law, where he announced, Einstein actually went, had a press conference and announced there had to be a God. Okay? So this is the general theory of relativity. I didn't wanna to go too deep in how it operates, but in the book, I go through um, how a, um, what do you call them? GPS works. The GPS is the general theory of relativity. You got an atomic clock on a satellite, they actually have to time it. They have to offset the, the satellite at a certain distance, a certain amount of time. It's almost nothing. It's like 0 .000187 seconds. Just, just a little bit from reference, a reference point on Earth so that when you drive your car, 
you can get an accurate distance to a place you're going with your GPS because the GPS is bouncing off satellites. There's a slight difference between it. It's the general theory of relativity and it's all based on distance. What did you say gravity is more of an interactive what? Uh, don't do that to me. I've got to remember my effect. It's, uh, but it's not an effect, it's an actual cause. It's actually working together. So if you go on the internet and read about it, don't be confused. Because Einstein discovered gravity doesn't, it's not a vector that pulls something directly, but it works on a mass, it can bend around it. Light actually bends around objects, and it does exert by that equation in the distance, it does exert attraction. Attraction is, does happen. Is the fabric analogy okay? And where you let, you stretch this fabric out and you set it. Yeah, I usually don't even get into it, because okay. right away people are gonna get confused. Sorry. We, that's okay, if people can grasp fact that general theory of relativity revolutionized physics and Christianity, <laughs> revolutionized it because all of a sudden everyone knew that something ain't right with our steady state model. Something's wrong with the fact that the universe, we, we say it's eternal, right? It's almost like where we're at right now with evolution. Everybody knows something's wrong. Right? There's something not right. And so what's gonna happen, I, I'm almost sure that what's gonna happen is it's gonna be eliminated, maybe it will take a few more years, from curricula of science because we know something's wrong. That's basically what was going on in the 1900s and when, like, like, um, like our scientists mentioned, uh, Schroeder, he said, when Wilson and Penzias, Bell Labs, when they found the cosmic background radiation, Combined with the Hubble law, that was it. Steady state's gone because now they have real data. So we don't have real data that shows evolution doesn't work because you can't test it. But something will happen eventually to make it clear, I think. Right now, that's why we're going through these arguments. Hubble law, this is now one of the most exciting things for me. For me personally, because I'm a statistician and this is what I do for a living. Literally, what Hubble found is a connection between motion and distance. And it's not a random one, it's an equation. And so what I always challenge skeptics with is can you name one operating system that's unguided, that operates by an equation? You, you can't. You can't find one because systems left to left to themselves operate randomly. For example, I look around the room, we have all different color hair. We have different color eyes. If everybody in this room had the same colored hair and eyes, just by that self, you'd think of something's a little funny. You normally would. If it was in a church, if you walked into a service, right, and they said, sorry, you're, you're brunette, um, people in here are blonde, what would you immediately think? It's a cult. <laughs> it's designed. It's been designed to be a certain way. If everybody here was the exact same height, same eye color, same hair, what would you think? I somehow put requirements out there saying you have to be this height, this hair color, and this eye color, you can't come, right? There had to be something. This Hubble law never happens unguided and randomly. You never have this. Basically what he found is a math equation that shows a linear relationship between velocities of galaxies and their distance from each other. Jastrow, he said, this is one of the greatest discoveries in science and it's a major supporter of the scientific story of Genesis. He's talking about Genesis 1-1. This is the book I told you about, you guys ought to go by, God and the Astronomers, just a little tiny book and it's awesome. And what happened is he invites Einstein. <laughs> so he invites Einstein to come out and see this. And this is where Einstein then went ahead and held a press conference. It says there has to be a beginning of the universe and a transcendent cause for the universe. When he saw this. As an example, if I were to take this book and I were to say to you, um, this book, I'm going to throw it in that corner. And this book has to, I'm going to record how it falls. And what I want is... Um, 
I'm going to have some equation that's going to be these distances. So if you think of the corner, there's the corner of the wall, right? I throw the book, and I'm going to have a certain distance here, and I'm going to have a certain distance here, right? And they're going to be exactly the same every time. Within plus or minus 0. 0.0001 inch. You think I can do it? On your own, no. I couldn't do it. I could sit there and go, <coughs> right? Now, if I did this a thousand times and I measured those all the times, I would never get this. Why not? Why couldn't I get it? Why not? There's a lot of variables going on right now. There's my position I'm standing, there's my arm swing, there's the temperature in the room, there's people watching me, I'm getting nervous, there's the wall might be off. I mean, there's all kinds of variables, right? There could be a thousand, who knows? There's all kinds of things going on. Even, I would challenge to say, even if I walked up and just went like this, I probably couldn't do that. Now, I, I probably could do, right? That's right, one inch. I could probably come over here, and because in my mind what I think one inch is, I could probably do it. How could I get to plus or minus this accuracy? How could I do it? Yeah, I have to get tiny little shims that are just right, almost a fixture, set it up so that I would just push it against that thing, right? And I have to have a measurement system because two sources of error when it comes to accuracy are operators and measurement systems. And parts, depending on where I measure from. So if I, if I measure over here versus here, I get different values. So variation in measurements are three things. The parts you're using, the operator doing the measurements, and the measurement itself, the gauge you use. You follow me? We have a Hubble law that's perfect. <laughs> so when we're sitting there looking at describing the location of a galaxy from a point of reference, it follows an equation in how it moves every time. How is that possible? Right? It's not possible. So what moved him from atheism to deism is the fact that he now understood this isn't just motion that's precise, it's also motion. It's two things. There's motion. Anytime there's motion, remember Newtonian physics, something caused it to move. Nothing moves on its own, and it follows a precise pattern, which is impossible without a design. So let's watch a little video on this for a minute. In the 1920s, astronomer Edwin Hubble came to work at the Mount Wilson Observatory in Southern California. The observatory offered some of the most advanced technology of the time. Using George Ellery Hale's magnificent telescope, Hubble photographed the nebulae, faint clouds of light that were a mystery to astronomers. When Hubble examined his photographic plates, he discovered a Cepheid, a kind of star that varies in brightness over a period of time. Hubble studied the variation in brightness and used the data collected to calculate the distance to the star. By his calculations, this star, and the galaxy it's a part of, were much further away than anyone had ever imagined, and the universe was much larger than the Milky Way galaxy. What he found was that the distance to M31, the Andromeda galaxy, one of turns out our nearest neighbors, is about two million light years. So people have been talking about the scale of our galaxy, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, maybe 100,000 light years. What this meant was that M31 and all those other galaxies were not part of our system. They were themselves big systems equal to the Milky Way. Scientists now know that there are billions of galaxies and each galaxy has hundreds of billions of stars. Hubble's discovery of the stunning size of the universe and the massive number of star systems within it 
revolutionized our picture of the cosmos. That discovery alone would have made Hubble one of the great astronomers, but he continued to study distant galaxies and made an even greater discovery. For five years, he gathered data on the movements of galaxies, recording their path and direction by studying the wavelengths of light. Different wavelengths of light appear as different colors of light. If the galaxy is moving away, its wavelengths of light are lengthened. This light appears redder. The faster the galaxy is moving away, the redder the light. If the galaxy is moving closer, the light wavelengths are shortened, so the light appears bluer. After many years, Hubble could sit down and look at this great quantity of information, and he plotted a chart. He plotted for the nebulae, the motions against the distances, and he found something truly amazing, a straight line. He found that the distance of a galaxy is proportional to its velocity. So as you go twice as far out, it turns out the velocity is twice as big. You go three times as far out, the velocity is three times as big. We live in a world, a big world, an extended universe, where everything's rushing apart, and it's happening in a way we call Hubble's law, where the velocity is proportional to the distance. Hubble's startling discovery means that the universe is expanding, and that concept forms the basis of the Big Bang Theory, which says that the universe began between 10 and 20 billion years ago from a state of enormous energy, density, and compression, and it has been expanding ever since. Three, two, one, and liftoff of the space shuttle discovery with the Hubble Space Telescope on the Earth. On April 25, 1990, the NASA crew aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery deployed the famous telescope named after Edward Hubble. It orbits about 380 miles above Earth's surface. That high up, the Hubble can view the cosmos unobscured by Earth's atmosphere, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Technology has advanced since Edward Hubble's time, but the work remains the same. The telescope's job is to collect images of stars in distant galaxies. These images help astronomers measure the age and size of our expanding universe. Is that cool? Mm. <laughs> now, why is this so such a big deal? If I can, can you imagine if you could write an equation to describe if I put this much money into this fund, I'll make this much. If you could figure out the stock market and come in and say, okay, if Z equals my retirement fund, and this is one, two, you know, and I have these stocks. If I, this is Z, this is my growth in my retirement fund. <laughs> this is my equation. So over, time, if I put $10 in here, 50 in here, $17.50 in here, I'm going to get a certain dollar. If I had, if I could do that, what would I be? The richest man on earth, wouldn't I? Orange egg. Right, orange egg. Um, why can't we come up with an equation that defines how the stock market works? Why can't we? Yes, it's random. If you ever find something in the stock market that has a special cause and it's not random, that person goes to jail, <laughs> right? Because it's, it's, it's meant to be random. It's the same thing if you go in a casino. That's why they call it Monte Carlo uh, simulations. That's what I do, part of what I do for a living. If you ever find a casino that's able to define how money, money you make by an equation, you go to jail because it's designed. Someone has designed it. So we have an operating system today that tells you exactly from any point of reference, the speed that a galaxy is moving relative to the distance from you to a precision over 97% almost. It's almost exact. And that's how the universe works and it's always a little apart. And yet, we're not willing to say there has to be a designer. Everything about what we talk about here, we accept because it's intuitively obvious. 
the year except anything that points to a God, a transcendent cause. You follow me? To me, this is very intellectually satisfying <laughs> to know we're finding more and more things that make my worship on Sunday and throughout the week very meaningful because it's the creator of the universe I'm talking to. Because here's some of the Hebrews 11.1, 1, the evidence of things not seen. He's like, don't worry, I got this. This is how the universe operates. So far, so good? Now, okay, is there anything biblically we can point to that says so? Okay, this is going to get a little crazy. All right, we're going to talk about this part now, this whole idea. We talked about Doppler shifts, right? Red light, when you see it, it means the object's moving away, right? You saw that in the video? Blue light would mean it's moving towards you. Everything Hubble saw had red light. Now, I want you to just try to get your head around that. You're on a planet, you're in Mount Wilson, looking through a telescope. There's nothing moving towards you. How's that possible? Wouldn't you think, <laughs> you know, you're on like a highway on planet Earth and there's another, maybe, uh, you know, Saturn's coming around and it's, you know, with you and so it passes you or, you know, Mercury or something. How come everything's red? Okay. So, it's called the universal expansion rate, what they discovered with Hubble's law and now they verified with the COBE satellite and many other satellites. If you think of a balloon that you're inflating, if I were to go ahead and glue pennies, or even just took a black magic marker and put dots, any marker or penny I put further away from where I'm blowing it up is gonna move different than the marker or penny close to my mouth. But they're not moving, because they're glued to the balloon. So the penny itself isn't moving. Right? It's glued down. Ooh. Do you get what, I'm, get what I'm trying to say? There's something, it's the air in my lungs that's going inside of a membrane that's stretching out and causing the penny to seem like it's moving. Are you getting me, what I'm saying? Right? Yeah, but it's not moving. Something's causing it to move. If I didn't blow into that balloon, it's just sitting there. So when you look at it, right, you've got that point that's moved to that point that's moved out to this point as the amount of air is increased. And this point that's now this point that's now that point is moving faster from the point where I entered the air than this point. It's moving faster. Go home and practice sometime. Take a balloon, put black highlighter at different points, and as you blow it up, you'll watch the balloon stretch out, and you watch the point further away, move faster further away, and go at a relative proportional distance, though, to from, from my mouth to it, at a speed that's proportional compared to the one closer. Can you say that, the, that um, if it was an explosion, you would have it's, if there was an explosion that created this, there would be some that of greater mass or lesser mass going, speeding away faster than others, right? From the, from the center. Okay. And are, you're saying this, they're equally all together expanding. Yeah, this isn't an explosion though. Oh, right, this, I this isn't the Big Bang. But people think of Big Bang and then they try to put it into this mold. Right. What's the difference between when we think about an explosion and this, and, uh, the expansion, what's yeah. the difference? Go Explosions ahead. Chaos. Right, but what else does an explosion have that this system doesn't? An explosion has an ending to it. <laughs> Once you explode, what happens to everything that explodes out? Disperses it disperses and dies out and it begins to go to equilibrium. So when we get to the cosmic background radiation, you'll see a perfect radiator in the universe. The heat pattern's perfect. This sucker's still operating. <laughs> this is a system operating, which is why Hubble was able to get an equation. You can only get equations for operating systems, not dead ones. Is that not cool? God says, let there be light. Boom! 
everything starts. And then he says, and by the way, just keep it going. <laughs> okay, so let's look at this. So, as you inflate the balloon, anything you blew on it spreads apart. It speeds proportional to the distance from the point that you're blowing it up, right? But the reality is they're glued to the balloon. So what the heck's moving it? It's my air in my lungs on a membrane that is flexible and expands even though the penny's not moving. It's a tough concept, right? You know how Hubble came to this? The red light, the Doppler light. He's like, wait a minute. I don't care where I look, behind me, in front of me, anywhere, it's all red. Everything's moving away. Why would anything be going? He didn't. Yes. Oh, he just knows. He didn't see any blue. That's why he was like, what the heck's going on here? Nothing's blue. Mm -hmm. It's like the pennies on the balloon. Everything is moving together. So what this is what got Einstein to admit there has to be a God. Mm -hmm. Guess who's blowing the air in the balloon? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> now see, you talk this way, people in church will think you know, you joined some kind of like three-headed monster cult, right? <laughs> Jesus blew in the balloon, because they don't understand. But yet when you read the Bible, God talks that way, right? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. Without Him, nothing was made that was made. So Jesus Christ made everything. Him. He's blown in the balloon. <laughs> so the Einstein said, okay, okay, I, I, I concede, I give up. Everything came from nothing, and someone started it. And they didn't just start it, they started it precisely in an equation. Okay. I, I get everything you're saying. To her point, if he's not seeing blue, where is it expanding from? Right. From us? From the Earth? No. We don't know. Okay. So here's what they do with the Big Bang Theory. You heard him say it in that video, this video, but you didn't hear Schroeder say it. Schroeder said what people are talking about now is quantum fluctuations, right? So there's a beginning point, quantum fluctuations. And then they say, or a compressed, infinitesimally small mass of something of this super bundled energy and everything inflated from there. Yeah, and it's like, well, wait a minute, we just said that we start from nothing, so it can't be that. So remember what Schroeder said, he goes, you're gonna struggle with this because people think in terms of time, space, and matter. And you're doing it right now, you're sitting here going, come on, come on, and God's saying, just, just trust me, trust me on this one. You're not gonna find in the material world that Point of blowing it up. It's just me, and I just did it. So Schroeder's saying what we call quantum fluctuations is the laws of physics, the forces which only describe things. That's all they are. Forces aren't things, right? Forces, forces are descriptions of things. Nobody knows what gravity is. They can describe it. <laughs> we can write an equation. We don't know what it is. Nobody knows what energy is. Nobody can define energy. They can describe it. There are things we don't understand, right? So we have a universe that started from no thing, and we now have, we know it has a beginning point, but we can't find within the universe that point. And why can't we find the beginning point within the universe? It's not within. Because it can't be within the universe, the universe couldn't have started. It would be like saying, I've got this awesome book, Shakespeare. I know somebody wrote it, there's an author. You know how I'll find the author? I'll look in the book. You know, <laughs> if I study Macbeth, I'm sure I'll come across the author. The author transcends the book, the author's outside. The, the, the book is the effect of the author. Does that make sense? It's from what she's saying, it's just confusing when you say, when you, because when you say everything's red, it implies the, that you're the center point, that everything is expanding away from Only you. if you're using the balloon as the best definition of an expanding universe. 
this is this is just something that helps us. Yeah. This is not how it works. This is just to get you to understand it, right? You can you can grasp the concept of a penny glued that doesn't really move, but the air that's inside is moving it, and it's proportional. It's an equation, so you can get that. It it might help to think that even if something is moving towards you, you're moving away from it faster than it's moving towards you. That, that so so we still stretch. Yeah, you rest. still see red. Which is yeah. awesome point. Awesome point. Go. Which is what drew Einstein to, to accept the first cause, because that's GPR. That's general theory of relativity right there. General theory of relativity didn't have an equation. Remember I told you he wrote down an equation, but it wasn't exact, but he knew things moved relative. Hubble comes up with the equation and says, this is how it works. So because of something like that, say you jumped onto the other side of the Milky Way and you look the other direction, you'd still be seeing red. No. That, that's where so I'm having saying? trouble with it, is right? I, I get the I get the red, everything's moving away. I just don't understand why things are. Because here's what you're doing. Here's what you're doing. You're sitting here, you managed to figure out how to jump off of Earth, and here you are over here, and you're out here on, oh, we're going to give them credit because nobody thinks they're a planet. <laughs> All right? And you're sitting here thinking, well, this guy's moving like this, I'm moving like this, and when I look backward, isn't he moving towards me or we're moving relative? But expansion doesn't move in a vector. Expansions, it's, it's, it's spreading, it's spreading all out. There is no unidirection to it. So it's all going like this. So as you look, this is your new point of reference. That new point of reference follows this law. From your point right there, you are now going to be calculating the change in velocity of Earth from the distance between that point and here to come up with a constant that defines how the two move relative to each other. It's going to be a red line, a red shift, because it's all moving relative based on your point of reference. You can be anywhere in the universe. It's always going to be the same. So what you're saying is this is like um, the expansion is like a shotgun. Everything <laughs> goes out, but there's still a proportional velocity between each shot. Yeah, but it, it can't be a shotgun because by definition, what, what do we mean by shotgun? Right, we mean somewhat random. So if you were to use the word shot, all we're saying is something happened. We don't know how it happened. And now everything moves uniformly to that point. And better than that, you can stand anywhere and measure from any point to a different object, and you are able to see how that point moves relative to you. Because he's sitting in California, Mount Wilson, and he's measuring 1,300 galaxies. These galaxies are behind him, in front of him. They're all over the place. And they're all moving relative to wherever he is. I mean, this is so mind-blowing that your average person doesn't think about it, right? And we don't teach it. And guess why? That's a, this, is a, this is a travesty to Christianity. And here's why. You think any ancient literature actually predicts <laughs> universal expansion rate? Um, if you look in the book, I pull out in Job, Psalms, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zechariah, they all talk about it. It's all in there. What you have here in Isaiah, my favorite one, he uses two different words. Nat Natam means to extend outward. Raka means to expand by spreading. So here it's saying God, God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, spread, spread them forth, the earth and that which comes from it. This is exactly what God is talking about, is the universe, Earth, everything, is being extended or stretched or spread, just like the, the membrane of a balloon, and just like the patterns we see in the universe for everything spread. And it's doing it according to an equation. And not only that, when we study fine-tuning, 
the universal expansion rate is so precise, life is on a razor's edge, it's like 10 to the 120th power, 10 to the 55th power, I forget, that if that expansion rate at which it's moving had any variation in it, we'd be dead. We couldn't live. <laughs> it's a lot, I know it's a lot. But again, in the book, go back and read these sections in the Old Testament and take a look. God is describing, saying, hey, actually, I give you a lot of evidence. You know, I'm telling you this, and when you discover these things, you'll know. I love it when I look so smart to people. It took me like <laughs> five years to get this. It took me so long to, to figure out what the heck's going on, because it's a difficult concept, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's my Took me a long time. What I would do is I'd study this stuff, then I'd go grab my atheist friends and I'd say, hey look, this is like, you gotta admit, I mean, this is crazy, right? And they'd say, oh no, that's, you can't trust the Bible. I said, well, I'm not talking about trusting the Bible, I'm saying we know this in science, the Bible said this, there seems to be a connection here, right? So it's amazing, it's amazing to me. Okay, here's the big one. This finally put the nail in the coffin that said we had to have the beginning of a universe, okay? Cosmic background radiation. Now, um, Arno Pendius and uh, Robert Wilson were scientists at Bell Labs. And what happened was, if you read the story, they're measuring the movements in, of radiation in the universe. This is part of something they're doing. They're tracking it. And they get all this haywire going on. And they, they're seeing these haywire images, almost like when snow gets on your direct TV satellite and your screen starts blurring up, right? And so what they think is they go up on the roof to check out what's going on and there are pigeons up there and they go, ah, okay, it's the pigeons. So they chase them away, they put some wire around it so they can't get back. They come back down, they get the same thing. It keeps happening. They discovered the heat trace of the universe from that. They kept looking, they took thermostatic measurements, they started recording, go, wait a minute, these are temperature <coughs> profiles, they're not aberrations. So the reason we now firmly set our sights on what we call the Big Bang is because what they found is that they now have a heat profile of the universe that's a perfect radiator. What do I mean by that? If I'm, let's say I go out to dinner and uh, my wife and I go out to dinner and in our kitchen it's, it's got doors, it's closed off, and I forget to turn off the oven, right? So I open the oven door because I think it's off, I forget to turn it off, and the setting's 300 degrees. What will happen to the room over time? What do you think happens when I get back? <clears throat> huh? It will get constant over time to 300 degrees, right? When I turn it off then, the temperature will start dissipating down to some profile until I, I introduce some heat, they call it a heat sink, right? Where I open a window or I'll do something and the temperature will come down to where I want it to be. We have a universe that has a profile that's within ridiculous amount of precision of a heat, of a heat, like a radiator, okay? So what they knew is there had to be something that ignited in the past for it to end up this way. Heat doesn't show up unless work has been done. You can only get heat if you do work. So there had to be something that happened. George Smoot, who won a Nobel Prize for this, he used the Kobe telescope to measure this. He said, we, ha we have found now irrefutable evidence for the birth of the universe. It's like looking at God. So there, there, was, there was something. <laughs> that had to create, so you got Hubble law, you got general theory of relativity, you've got Doppler effect, you got the universal, ex universal expansion law, and now you have the cosmic background radiation. I mean, think about how all this is adding together, guys. Right? <clears throat> so, what they discovered is the universe didn't just begin with a hot big bang, it actually erupted from a single event that now they can account for 99.97% of the energy in the universe. They can measure with Kobe satellites and figure out almost 100% of all the energy in the universe, the radiant energy, is in this radiator. I'm the only one that's excited. Do you see, you see why 
we give our lives to Jesus Christ, <laughs> as this starts adding up, you begin to realize, I ain't who I think I am. You know, I, these, these professional athletes crack me up. You know, they're the hottest thing going, you know, they throw the chalk up in the air and everybody cheers for them. They're the great. I mean, they're gonna die someday. They come and go. These people come and go all the time. This though, God speaks, and then he says, here's the evidence for you to understand who I am. <clears throat> so with a single explosive creation event that accounts for so much of the radiation, astronomers conclude the temperature fluctuations must have transformed the early cosmos into today's clump clusters of galaxies. So unfortunately what they're saying is, well, this gives credence then for the Big Bang, because guess what? After this explosive event, now that we have the forces, you know, things then started clumping together, and you know, we went from helium and hydrogen to gravity acting, to give planets, to give solar systems, to eventually give people. How about faith? <laughs> right, right. But the evidence that's piling up is absolutely something started from nothing with an explosion. So, is there any wisdom literature that actually predicts a cosmic background radiation and explosion? When you see this verse, a lot of people don't understand the Hebrew here. Do you know what God means when he says, let there be light? Light includes nuclear weapons. It includes any kind of light. It's not just like uh, infrared light. It can be gamma radiation, anything. It's The word is phos. So I think what God's saying here is, boom. Let there be light. Everything starts from nothing. Okay, so there's physics, the first part. Now, how's everybody doing? You doing okay? You cool? You feel you all right? It's a lot of stuff. It's a lot of stuff. Do you think skeptics understand this? They don't have a clue. The only people, the only, um, the only way these, these most people who are skeptics get this is from other skeptics who throw things out like Reader's Digest nonsense or you know discussions. This is what I keep telling people is this is taught in school. <laughs> this is stuff that people think is boring. They pay no attention to when they're a junior in high school or when they go into college. This is taught and points to a creator. All right, the first law has an equation. The first law says, for any isolated system, not an open system, an isolated one, any isolated system, an isolated system can be closed or by itself. I always have to explain this, because this is where skeptics try to trip you up. An open system means, aha, something can come in and act upon it, and when it comes in and acts upon it, it can make it the way that they want it. What I always say to them is, oh, so you think the universe could be an open system? Oh, sure. I said, good. Then miracles can happen. Well, no, they can't. Well, then it can't be an open system then. Because in order for you to say no miracles, the universe has to be closed and nothing can act on it. See, so people talk out of both sides of their mouth. I am, right now, an isolated system, and I could be an open system. I'm isolated because... If I don't drink or eat anything, what will happen? What will happen to me? I'm going to die. So I can't be an open system because an open system would feed me what I need. Things would come in to keep me alive. I'm isolated. I have to act myself. Does this make sense? A candle. If I put a candle and I light it, right, that's an isolated system. And it's probably the purest form of entropy we'll talk about in a minute. All it's doing is giving off heat. That's it, right? So every system is isolated by itself, subject to the environment it's in. So the equation for the first law is if you take however a system ends up, its resulting state of energy, you subtract how it started, its beginning state, whatever difference in energy you have, it's gonna be equal to the work that was done minus the heat that went out. Think about yourself. How many times when you're working out do you start out going, you know, I better eat something for my workout because otherwise I'm going to be drained. So you have a certain level of energy when you start, 
when you finish, your energy level won't be the same because you've depleted, you've worked, right? If you're lifting weights, if you're doing anything. So the difference between those two states of energy is nothing more than how much heat you let out and the work you accomplished. So in the first law, nothing's lost. It's just converted to a different form. You follow me? Einstein put it together this way. He said, you know, really the way it works is um, matter and energy are just the same thing. They're just in different forms. I can turn matter into energy. You can turn energy into matter. This is, there's a page in my book on how a nuclear bomb works. <laughs> so you can, you, can <laughs> you can read about how you can transfer between the two states. But basically, that's how he came up with E equals MC squared. And the, the bottom line is the stuff in the universe is constant. It just depends on how you use it. So there's five rules. Rule number one, there's no new matter or energy that comes into existence anywhere in the universe. Every bit of matter is still here. Everything's still here. It's just being converted into different forms. When you die, what, what happens to the, your matter, your, your sources of energy? What, what, how does it get transferred to a different form? What do you think? Yep. Yeah. You ever, uh, well, you ever see Lion King? Right? Lion King, the movie kind of got off on a little bit of uh, mystical stuff, but this whole circle of life thing is almost like the first law. You know? Um, lion eats a zebra. The zebra may cease to exist in terms of life, but the energy from the zebra is now in the lion. The lion can then convert it into mechanical energy by running. Uh, but when the lion eventually dies, it gets converted. And you know what? You know, the grass grows now from the nutrients of the dead lion. And the, I mean, it just goes on and on. But nothing's being destroyed. And no new forms are being created. So systems aren't using up energy. They're just converting it. I wrote two articles in the paper on this on your HVAC system, where um, my first article was the first law of thermodynamics that explains how um, you are converting different energy forms in an HVAC system with your compressor. And then the second one was on the second law about why you have to make sure you're dissipating heat in your coils outside, because if you don't, it's inefficient, the oil actually fail is everything, we've never been able to design a perfect system that doesn't give off heat. Third rule, heat and work are forms of energy transfer. A system's energy is conserved, but it changes as heat and work transfer in and out of it. You're doing it every day. Every day you guys live. You're eating sandwiches, you're drinking fluids, you're converting sources of energy from potential to kinetic, just one to the other. Your car right now sitting in the parking lot. What kind of what kind of potential energy does it have? An energy source that hasn't been used yet. Gasoline. Your car ain't gonna move by itself. It has a liquid form of potential energy. How do you convert that? Huh? Yeah, what you do is when you turn that switch, you know what's going on? You get a spark. Now, what is the spark doing? It ignites the potential energy, but you need something else to get mechanical. You need pressure, a closed system. So when you turn on uh, and create heat, what does heat want to do in a system? What does it always want to do? Good thing we have underarms and sweat glands and everything. Heat wants to dissipate. In your engine, we don't let it out. And when we don't let it out, guess what happens? Pistons start moving, <laughs> uh, shafts start turning. We just turn liquid potential energy of gas into gaseous energy and combustion into mechanical energy of the shaft. So we're not, we didn't use up anything, we just converted it. That's the first law. 
Fourth one, since nothing new will be created and, and neither matter nor energy will ever cease to exist, the universe obeys this law because we know this doesn't happen. So that equation is how the universe works. Therefore, by rules one to four, it can't create itself. Natural laws could never explain it because you can never get a form of energy coming into existence on its own. It just can't happen. This is a lot, but this is, these are basic things. That's why I have these classes to make sure you get a basic understanding, and this book explains it, but it's meant to link back to the Bible so you understand that there might be some wisdom literature out there that can help you grasp this. It says, all things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made. All things were made by a transcendent external cause who brought these things into being. So there's no violation of the first law because he's outside the system. Does that make sense? Okay. Second law. Second law has a pretty cool equation. It says that the final state of entropy or disorder minus the first state, if you took the difference between them, it would be the same as how much heat was in the system at the end minus the heat that you started with divided by a temperature range. So in other words, how run down I am after a workout, how much heat I gave off, energy versus where I began, will be defined by how I started, how much I had. <clears throat> Divide by temperature. All right, so what does this mean? It means there's two rules. Number one, the energy that's available for an isolated system is always decreasing. Always decreasing. What you have available to you will never stay there. You have to replenish it. You have to put it back in. Therefore, you're always moving to lower levels of usefulness. You're always moving towards disorder. I know the feeling. My back hurts. My bones are sore. I'm always moving to a place where I'm weaker and weaker, and soon, no matter what I put in, it won't be enough. Good example. If I drop a drop of dye in water, what does it do? <coughs> It disperses out to equilibrium. If I go ahead and get a car, we just talked about the first law, but you know why you can't touch your engine? And when you immediately after you turn it off? Because of the second law of thermodynamics. There's heat being given off, it's not being contained. You're losing heat. That's the second law. So the question is is there any wisdom literature that helps you understand the second law? Romans says this, the creation will be one day delivered from the bondage of decay. In the Greek, decay means from equilibrium or disorder. You can go to Isaiah 51.6 and it talks about how everything grows old like a garment. And just think about how a garment grows old, it wears out. That's exactly what you have. So, the question I get from non-believers is, well, wait a minute. How do biological systems like us, which are supposedly moving towards disorder, how do we maintain such a high degree of order? Look at us, our hair looks good. We're, what, we're well groomed, everybody's dressed right. How come we're not just all breaking down into puppies? You know, look at, why are we able to maintain order? Okay, fact number one. Fact number one says isolated systems left to themselves run down. Everybody cool with that? Makes sense. Okay? Fact number two <laughs> says um, in order to maintain order and complexity, systems need energy and information. Something has to be put in. I will not go to a junkyard garage and find a push that looks like that second one. I'm going to find the first one, right? Because over time that's what happens. So how does that second push stay that way? If naturally it can't, it's because you have a whole group of guys 
right, that are maintaining the Porsche. There's an external agent that provides the energy and information for the Porsche to function. You follow me? We have to eat. We have to replenish all the time. If we don't, even when we do, we wear out. Now, I'm going to show you a video that's it's about four minutes. It's from this guy, A.E. Wilder Smith. He's just a triple PhD guy. He passed away, but he does a very simplistic explanation that I really like. Let's see if it helps. Does any wisdom <laughs> explain this? Right? It's by your will all things exist. It's by him. We exist and we maintain ourselves because he keeps us going. He keeps all the planets in motion. He keeps the whole universe. So let's watch. Solutionists maintain that our Earth isn't a closed system at all, that it is open to the sun's energy, and that the energy of the sun's rays, for instance, created the life on our beautiful planet. But is energy enough, even when you have an open system? There are a number of problems with the theory of evolution particularly from the point of view of thermodynamics. The laws of thermodynamics are three. The second law is that the amount of work available uh, for useful work in a closed system decreases. Another way of saying that is that the order or organization of matter in a closed system goes down, it descends into chaos. Now, there are exceptions, and these exceptions confuse. If you take, say, something dead, like a, a stick, that formerly was growing and using the sun's energy to increase its order, but it's now dead. Now, if I expose that stick in to, to sunlight in, a open, in an open system, this stick will get warm. In fact, it's quite warm now because the sun is quite strong. Now that means that its organization is decreasing. Its entropy is increasing. Now that's in an open system. Why doesn't it all? It's getting hotter and hotter because the sun by itself is heating it up and it can't do anything about it. So far so good? Okay. Organization increase. It should do according to the law of evolution, the, the postulates of evolution. If I take, on the other hand, not a dead stick, but something that's living, like this nice little orchid here, early spotted uh, orchid, uh, that orchid is absorbing sun's energy just as this stick is absorbing the sun's energy. But the energy that falls on that from the sun is by coupled reactions being used to increase the order to grow. And the chlorophyll does that. But if I kill this orchid, if I were to pick it and let it die, the energy of the sun would fall on it, and then it would get hotter and therefore more disorganized. What's the difference then between the stick, which is dead, and the orchid, which is alive? The difference is that the orchid has active, what the scientists call, teleonomy in it. It's a machine which is capturing energy to increase order. This machine is dead and is not capturing energy to reduce uh, disorder and to increase order. There's the difference. Where did the teleonomy come from? The teleonomy, the ordering principle, does not reside in matter itself. But it does reside in life. And where you have life, you have teleonomy. And then the sun's energy can be taken and make the thing grow that is increasing order. Catch that? I, as a scientist, must therefore postulate a source of information to supply teleonomy or know how. I don't find it in this universe, and therefore I assume that it's transcendent to this universe, and I believe myself in a living God who did it. I believe that this God who supplied the information 
revealed himself in the form of a man so that man could understand him. We're made to understand. We're homo sapiens. If God made us to understand, I want to understand. I want to understand God. But I can only do it if he comes down to my wavelength, which is the wavelength of man. Therefore, I believe that God uh, revealed himself in the form of Christ and that we can serve him and know him in our hearts as the source of the Logos, all information necessary to make the universe and to make life itself. Is that cool? This is, we just went through all those nine. Is it that bad? Is it okay? If there's more information you can read, get you up to speed a little more. If you're in the classroom now for the scholarship stuff we talked about, so next week we begin the design, the second argument for God, design of the universe. So read the first three chapters of that, okay? Um, and uh, any comments? Everybody good? Huh? That is A.E. Wilder Smith. This is who he is. You can go on my website now, right? And you can go under Books and Lessons, go to Book 2. You can go in there and find that video under Origins. All right, guys.